So I would like to welcome you all to Justice for TJ. Thank you for those of you who braved the weather for coming out. It seems like even the weather is rallying with us today. While some of us may feel cold and uncomfortable, it is nothing like what TJ felt when he was in the Edmonton Remount Center and what he experienced. Um, to begin today's press conference, the person we need to for hear for first and foremost is Lana Green, TJ's mom. Lana joined us. She's a mom of the Harm member. She joined us here from BC and we rallied our Edmonton troops and um, we are here to support Lana today. So Lana, um, I'll pass it over to you and um, you, you'll, you'll do great. And afterwards for the media here, Lana is also available for questions afterwards. Hi, uh, my name is Lana Green. I'm TJ's mom. <laughs> He called me Mama, so I'm going to say I'm TJ's Mama. Uh, he, uh, he was described by a lot of his teachers and his friends and people that knew him as having a twinkle in his eye. He, he was full of energy and had a real zest for life. Um, he, uh, he was a lot of fun if he was in the room you were laughing, even if you shouldn't be. Uh, just a really good kid. He liked sports. He, he was the kind of kid that was friends with everybody. Uh, he grew up in a small town in northern Alberta. He, what I speculate is where things began. Uh, he suffered a few concussions and then started to deal with depression and was diagnosed with bipolar disorder uh, probably when he was about 17 and started self-medicating and on on the path with the that's when the the drug the substance use came into the picture in TJ's life and um, long story short he ended up he was, he was trying to get a, access to a treatment bed, which we were consistently met with six to eight week wait times or just not accepting people due to COVID at the time. Uh, and he landed in the Edmonton Remand Center on September the 4th of 2020, where he began asking for treatment uh, upon arrival. He was expressing that he was um, depressed, had anxiety. He was very forthcoming about having addictions and wanting medicine to help him not crave drugs. He, um, he wrote on medical request forms that he was surrounded by drugs in the ERC and he was having trouble to not crave them. I just wanted to read out I wrote down his words, sorry. He says, I'm having a lot of trouble refraining from using drugs in here and I'm scared I'm gonna lose my life. Sorry. When I get outside, back around um, even more pressure to use. I want to leave this life behind. I've overdosed 16 times. I was on Suboxone on the outside. Please start me on that again. I used to be on it and I was functioning in society and refraining from drugs in a long time. That was in November. Those health requests were ignored. I just want to read his very last request on January the 1st. He says, I'm sorry to bug. I know I'm on the waiting list, but I've been here for four months and soon I'll be back out on the streets surrounded by drugs and hopelessness. TJ cited the problem 
started five years ago. Please let me start on my suboxone treatment. I will not abuse this privilege. Uh, they wrote him back on January 5th to let him know he was finally placed on the wait list for consideration for sub <clears throat> suboxone. And he was found deceased in a solitary cell on January the 11th. So I just really wanted to say, especially with, um, with Alberta's recovery model, boasting new treatment beds and treatment being the only way and abstinence that, that you don't need to force people, you just actually need to give them access when they ask if that's what they want and that all human beings should be treated with dignity and respect whether they use drugs or not and I just want to thank you for listening and coming out. Um, I hope that not only we make recommendations that I hope that the judge states that maybe it's time for someone outside of these inquiries to actually go in the ERC and document what is happening to people. Why are so many people dying? Why are there so many public fatality inquiries with the ERC on them? I want them to consider um, when someone arrives with well-known history of mental health and substance abuse issues and they're asking for these things or even if they're not, that we should be assessing them and prescribing medications so that their brain and their body becomes well while they're in the remand and, you know, um, it's an opportunity for them to become well on their path of wellness. Yeah, I, um, he and I were very close. He told me everything. There's nothing in that binder that's a surprise. <laughs> um, I was very proud of him for asking because he wasn't always ready. And so I was very proud that and encouraging him to keep asking. Um, I also want to say when he passed, there were no drugs in his system, meaning the last four months of his life he was not using even though he was surrounded by the drugs in there um, I just like to say I would never call it uh, that he got clean because he was never dirty and I'm just very proud that he was able to do what he was able to do while he was in there I think previous to this um, I truly believed there was choice involved and I think society believes it's a choice and if people want to choose to get better they can. What TJ has taught me is people are in places where their journey has taken them and they're begging for the help and they're being ignored and that is so wrong. I cannot be quiet. That particular letter, I read it that he was being very forthcoming. He almost lost his life, life 16 times and he was begging for help. He was scared he was going to die. Um, he very much wanted to stay alive. Yeah, I think it was a cry for help. It, you know, whether we were, read the words a certain way or the other, it was, we can all agree it was a desperate attempt to get some help again after several months of asking. It did before, now no. I, I, I learned a lot on this journey. I, it's pretty well known that drugs are available and specifically in the ERC there have been an alarming amount of overdoses happen in those walls. People with mental illness and addiction shouldn't be in jail. <laughs> yeah. And I that would think be we the need top. to think about his words too, that he wasn't going to waste a privilege. As a healthcare provider, that, that is astonishing to me that he felt that it was a privilege. He should be offered it as soon as he 
has asked the first time. It's, it, they're just, and, and even if he did miss a meeting, we need to start being accessible and providing accessible care for people and meeting them where they're at. And that didn't happen for TJ. But thinking as, as a, a medicine, as a privilege, I hope that sits with people. Because that, that really sits with me as a healthcare provider. That's disgusting yeah. that, that he was made to feel that he could mess up. Yeah. And on their Alberta Health Services form, the number one way to find those things out is to communicate with the family. I would like to say that never happened. They never once asked me, nor have they ever apologized. They told me to get a lawyer to get answers as to what happened to my child. So, yeah, I think it's alarming that they're not communicating with families to find out what medications are are uh, people taking and yeah all like I think you heard in there all of that was on net care they seen he had been admitted into the hospital numerous times before being in remand yeah as a family member too you don't want to call the remand no. you don't want to put your child on the radar like that that, that is well known as for most parents that you don't call. Because first of all, you won't get a call back, but something will happen. So there's a lot the public doesn't understand about this system that unfortunately you find out as you're dealing with it. Any more questions of Lana at this point? Thank you, Lana. You, Thank you. You're super brave. Thank you're you. a fantastic mom. Lana, joined a club that she never planned to join. She's a member of Mom Stop the Harm. She's getting grief support and support in our advocacy from our organization. And, and yeah, Angie's lucky. She's got Brandon with her. I have got my oldest with me, but we, the four of us, we also just all lost children to, to this crisis. Um, I want to thank you for coming out. Um, if you want to hear from Brandon, uh, Brandon's up next. Hello, guys. Um, my name's Brandon. Um, going into the remand center takes a physical and emotional and mental toll on the body and the soul. About twice a year, I would land myself in the remand on breaches and warrants that accumulated over, over time. And to be honest, I would do just about anything to stay out of jail, except make it to court. <laughs> because for me, ending up in custody meant getting violently sick and experiencing the weight of 12 years of drug use fall on my shoulders all at once. The mental and emotional toll that this takes on a person's psyche can be damaging at best. The shame of walking away from my family, all those missed opportunities at the hands of my drug use, every fiber of my being screaming with nowhere to go, that desperation can lead you to do some insane things. But in, in, in a prison institution, healthcare workers are supposed to be our allies. We cannot trust the correctional officers to look after our well-being. Um, we, know, you know, we know where their loyalty lies. This is simple. We know this. So when a nurse or a doctor or a healthcare worker of any kind can be so callous, so cold towards a person that depends on them, these nurses and doctors, they get into healthcare to help, to make a difference. Are we not worthy of their help? I hope that this weighs heavy on the shoulders of those responsible. And I hope that you carry these feelings of guilt and shame with you every single day so that you may never treat a person so coldly, so callously, and with such gross incompetence ever again. TJ was a young man who had a mother, a beautiful son, and a partner. And it's because of a broken system that he wasn't able to come home. Thank you. Horrible, absolutely horrible. And to have to do it alone, you know, and um, to have to do it when you're being treated with such disgust, it's, it, it makes it hard, you know? Um, I, I, yeah, I can't, I can't imagine, yeah. Yeah, it's, you know, like, 
I've been, you know, using drugs since I was probably 13. Um, and, you know, it took a long time for me to, like, reach out, you know, uh, you know, in any area of my life. Um, you know, it, 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 you know, it, yeah, it's hard to reach out, you know, but especially when, you know, in the system where you're reaching, the people you're reaching out to, it's almost like they're unreachable. So it's almost like there's, there's no point in reaching out, you know, it's, um, yeah. I think there needs to be, you know, recommendations in the way the policies and the way just the system is set up. I think there needs to be, when people come in, people need to be assessed. I think there needs to be more of a healthcare aspect to that in order to like assess somebody's well-being and how they are. I don't think just assuming that everyone can tough their jail sentence out is acceptable. Um, I think that also the people that did not do their checks on TJ, they need to be held responsible, like bottom line, because these fatality inquiries keep happening and it's, you know, people continuously not doing their jobs, not treating us like human beings. So when are we going to hold those people responsible? You know, they can hide behind the judge who says we're not looking to find responsibility, but at the end of the day, like, yeah, I don't know. It's another fatality inquiry, you know, and it's horrible because we're here, you know, but it's like, uh, I'm trying to be hopeful. Totally. <laughs> no, no. So we were quoted six months. So I ended up having to detox on my own with my mom. She was my, my nurse, my, my everything, right? in that time so we ended up having to you know go from the hospital i was in the hospital and there was no options it was either that or the hope mission so i had said yeah i'll do it um my mom found me a spot where i could detox and i did it she um and she she asked me if i can guarantee you a roof over your head can you guarantee me that you can make it another day right and we, and we did it day by day and um we're here right and then you got on meds yeah, and it wasn't because we, my mom, like, you know, tough love. There was no tough love about it, you know? There was, yeah, you know, so, yeah. How long ago was that? It took about, it was about two months. March, March 12th is when I came out of the hospital, so March 12th, 2023. But the detox itself <laughs> was about two months. Two months. Like, yeah. Yeah. Yep. On medication. Congrats. On medication. Sober, not clean because I was never dirty. Yeah. Never dirty. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. But he's doing amazing and he's registered for school and, you yeah. know, TJ deserved that, right? There needs to be a whole systematic change in how a cultural change in how the guards are trained, how healthcare providers, it needs to happen when healthcare providers are in school, that training should be happening. It, we need a massive amount of change in these systems because it's just going to keep happening. Totally. 100%. Um, yeah, 100%. I, I'm not, I can't, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you, everyone. One of the demands we have as Mom Stop the Harm is that we treat substance use and mental health like a mental health issue, not like a criminal issue. We also have one to close us off with a statement from um, um, Benjamin Perrin, prof at UBC School of uh, Allard School of Law. Ben would very much like to be with us today, but he sent this statement. Today with heavy hearts, we remember Timothy McConnell, fondly known as TJ, who tragically lost his life to suicide in the Edmonton Remand Center on January 11, 21. Our deepest sympathies to TJ's family, especially his mom, Lana. TJ deserved better. His death calls for truth, accountability, and lasting change that, that such a tragedy never repeats itself. Yet TJ's story is not an isolated incident. Federal studies reveal a staggering reality. Individuals behind bars are eight times more likely to die from homicide or suicide compared to the general population. An Ontario study found that nearly half of all deaths in custody were individuals grappling with mental health or substance use issues. <coughs> Despite the formal abolition of the death penalty in Canada in 76, far too many people with mental health issues and those who use substances, their incarceration is effectively a death sentence. 
the harsh reality is that correctional facilities, instead of providing support, often exasperates the suffering of vulnerable individuals. The use of force and harsh conditions only serve to deepen the trauma and distress they all suffer. This is heartless, cruel, and wrong. The outrage over TJ's death in custody is part of a growing national call for change. Recently, the coroner's inquest journey, journey, jury into the homicide of Suleiman Kfakari in Ontario univocally concluded that correctional facilities are not an appropriate environment for persons in custody experience significant mental health issues. Instead, the jury recommended immediate steps to ensure that any person in custody experiencing an acute mental health crisis is admitted to hospital for assessment when appropriate treatment in a therapeutic setting that is, that is safe. Let us honor TJ's memory by demanding justice, compassion, and reform. Together, we can build a society where no one suffers silence behind bars. And we stand here today with Lana to call for justice, not just for TJ, but really justice for all. Far too many die in correctional institutions in this country and it needs to change. And hopefully this review will, will be one step further towards that change. So once again, I want to thank you all for braving the cold. Um, anybody have any more questions of Lana or Brandon or anybody else? No. So. Thank you so much. And Lana, how do you feel about um, our little, our press conference, Picket in the Freezing Cold? <laughs> I just feel like you guys are amazing and I don't know what I would do if you guys didn't do what you've all done. Because it makes me know people care. We care. Yeah. We do care. We all care. Yeah. And you're not alone in this. Yeah. You're not alone in you have to go back into that in that hostile courtroom. Yeah. And you're his voice, and you have Chris with you. And yeah. Yeah. We'll fight for justice. Yes. Oh, thank you. Thanks. Thank you.